this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. It is college football bowl season. We're going to break down where you can find some betting value at the biggest bowls of the 2019-2020 season with Ed going through his numbers over at ThePowerRank.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by the aforementioned Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com and find him on Twitter at the Power Rank Ed. Happy bowl season to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. This week has been super fun because I get to talk about bowls with people like you. Uh, I've been doing uh, kind of a daily series on my own podcast where I just get to talk about various aspects of bowls. Uh, last week was a lot of time uh, through the tedious details of going through each of these bowl games and, and writing out my bowl report. Um, you know, which, which, I mean, I enjoy doing it, but not as much as talking about these games afterwards. So, right. uh, yeah, I'm in a really good spot this week. Uh, pumped, to accept, pumped to talk about some bowl games. And, uh, yeah, we got a lot of good stuff on the— Do you have any, the... like, big-time bowl memories? Because for me, I always remember I, th- I was, like, sitting in— I think it was my mom's basement, uh, which is <laughs> very stereotypical for a guy who does— uh, fantasy sports <laughs> betting and podcasting stuff. Anyway, it was it was true. I was in my mom's basement. I was watching Baylor in their bowl game, and RG three had like one of the most disgusting performances I've seen in my entire life. Uh, I was right. against Washington. Uh, you know, he, he, I think he he didn't he, like his stat line there wasn't like disgusting or anything, but like the game itself, sixty seven to fifty six. Uh, that was the Alamo Bowl, Bowl back in 2011. Right. I, I, like, I just remember watching that entire game and it being like this just joyous experience. Uh, any bowls specifically stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, the the Statue of Liberty, Boise State, yeah. Oklahoma Bowl game definitely stands out to me. I think my wife and I had just bought a new TV, yeah. which was like pretty awesome back in 2008, I think it was. Uh, it just moved. I mean, was it 2005? I'm looking at it right now. 2005, because uh, we had just moved to San Francisco, got this new TV, and then it was like the most amazing game ever. Yeah, it was um, after the 2006 season, uh, but it was in 2007 because okay. it was on January 1st. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that, w- that was definitely a memory. Uh, USC versus Texas, the Vince mm-hmm. Young, uh, Reggie Bush lateraling <laughs> for a fumble game was definitely up there as well. Yeah, I think that, like, we could talk about good games. I just prefer really bad games that are really entertaining. Uh, we're actually going to talk about the cheese it Bowl later on. I think that last year's cheese it Bowl was also wildly entertaining, but for, like, different reasons, because it was one of the most hideous games that I've ever seen played in the history <laughs> of, like, the universe. So bowl season can be beautiful in multiple respects. And it can be beautiful because it's so bad, too. And it gets underway very soon. We're going to break it all down and how you can bet bowl season here in just one second. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. because tomorrow we're going to have an NFL preview of Week seven or week 16 with, with Edward Egros as well, breaking down his favorite bets of the week. So make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, you can find us there. And while you're there please leave a rating and review as well. There is no cover in the past for today because there are no things to wrap up from last week. But before we dive in here to covering the present and taking a look at these bowl games and how Ed bets bowl games, I want to remind you that if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's pause now and dive into this bowl season. Let us know where Ed sees some betting value for this year. Covering the present. Already, Ed, bowl season, as mentioned, is coming up right around the corner, and you actually released an entire bowl report over at the Power Rank, and uh, you sent me a copy, and I was slipping through it, and it's a lot of work that it went into this thing. How long does that actually like, take to prepare, just like from a, a preparation perspective? Yeah, I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Bring you back time. to the dark days? Um, I mean, there's 40 games, 39 mm-hmm. games. 
39 games. Enough. And I essentially go through each one. Uh, I look for injuries and player absences, try to get that. Uh, try to figure out matchups. You know, if a team has a particularly good defense or a particularly good offense, try to mention that as well. Try to look at the location of every game. There's actually two teams that are playing on in their home stadium. Um, you know, it's a little bit different with bowl games. That's still only maybe like a quasi home kind of thing. But like, I mean, I think it's important to know that. Uh, so yeah, just go through all those things and uh, write up a couple paragraphs, uh, uh, maybe a couple sentences to depending on on what the situations are. Oh, quarterbacks. Yeah. If if if, if a team played multiple quarterbacks over the season, I kind of want to know the context of that, whether they dropped off, whether they got better. Uh, you know, for example, Quentin uh, Quentin Dormady at, at Central Michigan came back and their offense got a lot better. A uh, big part of their run to almost winning the MAC championship game. So, so things like that, things that you want to pay attention to if you're a better, things that can kind of change your prediction. And um, yeah, so yeah, that was a lot of last week and finished it up. Uh, I guess Monday was yeah. everything got got put together. And oh, can and people the- still still get that bowl report over at the Power Rank now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's still up there. Okay, perfect. Uh, so you can find that over at thepowerrank.com. This thing includes, like like Ed said, it has his numbers on every game uh, for the bowl season. It also has, like, a ranking of confidence. Uh, if you're playing on ESPN, I believe they have, like, confidence numbers for each game based on how, you know, likely you think uh, that team is to win that game. And you actually sprinkle in some stuff, too, that we talk about a lot from March Madness, where right. you can see how often the public is picking Team X. And right. if your numbers give them lower odds of winning, that's a spot to be contrarian. And I think that I wouldn't have thought of that process for this. It makes a ton of sense for, like, for like a bracket, right. but it also makes sense that it would go here. It's, it's something I would have thought of personally. Yeah, I know. And it's interesting, too, because it, it really matters what type of pool you get into. Mm-hmm. Um, you actually can't be contrarian in a pool in which every game is worth the same. Right. Um, because you can't change the variance of re- results. Um, so you have to the only way you can change the variance of your results is to mess with the confidence points. And so those are the type of pools that, that you want to be in. And I talk about actually, I mean, there's a there's a there's a big post on my site where I talk about that. Uh, from a couple years back, it still applies. But but yeah, no, all the fun of March Madness, uh, we get to do that during bowl season too. It's just like a, a little preview, a little warm up for March, <laughs> and uh, definitely good to get us back in the swing of things for that. So again, check that out over at thepowerrank.com. But from a betting perspective, I think that the bowl season is very interesting because it's kind of fluid. You know, we've always got it changing and not knowing. If guys are going to play, if they're going to sit out, there was news just this week that Georgia is going to be with both their starting tackles for this game. And we've had this happen for a couple of years, and I think Christian McCaffrey and Leonard Fournette kind of keyed this off. And we've got yep. a couple years of data now, Will Greer last year. Do you think that books are doing a good enough job of accounting for these absences? Or can we still get a bit of an edge if we're paying attention to who will or will not be playing? Yeah, I mean, it, I think you have to go on a case by case basis. You know, we'll talk about Alabama. You know, their top corner is not playing. If you watched a lot of Alabama games and you know how well, like whoever's going to replace him is, um, you know, Edward Egros has told me about how Saban gets all his guys ready. Yeah. You won't see a drop off like you saw with Texas as secondary when they had a, a bunch of injuries. You know, if you've watched, I haven't watched enough Alabama games to to make that assessment, but. If you have, I definitely think there's there's an edge there. You know, Michigan's got some really good receivers. So I think you go with a case-by-case basis. You know, if it's some some linebacker that doesn't have NFL potential, then, you know, there probably shouldn't be much of an adjustment. If it's a first-round cornerback pick and, you know, Michigan's bringing in NFL talent at receivers, that, that could matter. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that with the Georgia example, we're going to talk about Georgia versus Baylor in a little bit. When it's both starting offensive tackles, that's – very difficult for me to ignore because sure. both those dudes carry like you know first round equity uh from an nfl draft perspective it sounds like deandre swift it sounds like he's gonna play uh he hasn't officially I will, like i don't think he said officially that he is but i i will believe that when i see it this yeah. guy has a bomb shoulder got two carries in the sec championship game is probably a pretty high pick in the nfl draft um I don't. I don't think he play. I don't think he plays in this game. Well, I don't know why he would either, because Baylor's a good defense. You know, like they don't have a reputation for being a good defense, but they're and not bad. They're a physical defense, right? Like they like to slam guys on the ground. Like if, if you've seen any of their games, right? 
And the other part, too, is if you were a running back running behind an offensive line that is lacking two elite, you know, tackles, you know, coll- collegiate tackles, probably not going to be a good showcase for your draft stock. So, right. like, DeAndre Swift, might you might want to consider potentially sitting this one out. I, again, I don't think he's officially announced yet, but those two guys right. have. So keep abreast of these things and, like, try to know, I guess, too. Try to be ahead of these things, too. If you think sure. there's a really good chance that someone's going to say they're not going to go, we saw that that line move for Georgia already a point with the announcement that their tackles were going to, you know, skip this game. So try to be ahead of things when you can. But, Ed, that's, that's not the easiest task by any means. Yeah, it's not. I mean, you know, Georgia probably has a couple five stars yeah. backing up those yeah. tackles. So, um <laughs> Yeah, so definitely an area where if you do your homework, you can you can potentially get an edge. Absolutely, and it's uh, it's definitely it's there's a lot of wheels in motion here, but there are major upsides to being aware of the effects of that. Uh, what are some other factors that help you when you're trying to spot inefficient lines for bowl games? Because I think that we talked about this a little bit last week, but there are definitely the, – the, the, the difference in schedules for these teams is going to be wider than it is during the regular season. Is that one of the big things you look at when trying to find inefficient lines? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the number, you know, my numbers kind of speak for themselves because, I mean, the one thing I'm very confident about is the way I adjust for strength schedule. Uh, you can definitely see that uh, if if there's an SEC team going against an ACC team, you know, probably my numbers are going to be on the side of the SEC team against the spread. Uh, there's actually one example where uh, an ACC team is favored to, to actually win the game outright. Um, but that's something that you can just kind of get from the numbers. Yeah. Uh, I think something else that I, that I try to do in the report and I try to look at for teams, uh, you know, a team that has gotten perhaps lucky in one score games, uh, for example, like Baylor, they were five and zero in one score games, uh, heading late into the season. You can see that when they struggled a bunch, uh, I think that West Virginia game that we talked about yep. and then they, uh, you know, and then they lost two one score games to, uh, Oklahoma to, to kind of end their season. Uh, but still, they were five and two in one score games. And that's something like, can that team like that be overrated? Uh, those are the things to to kind of look for as well. Like teams that aren't as good as their record suggests, uh, maybe like a Wake Forest or something like that as well. Or maybe aren't as bad as the record suggests. Right. I was reading through your bowl preview. You can talk about Iowa State, a team that we have talked about a lot on this podcast. And if you look at their record, a seven and five, you'd be like, why on earth were Jim right. and Ed talking about this team in the preseason as being like a, a good team? But I think you said they were two and five in one score games, which is right. probably not sustainable. Right, exactly. I mean, I mean, you know, and honestly, they really should have beaten Northern Iowa by more than than one score, which which they did as well. But yeah, uh, I mean, that's a that's a perfect example of what we're talking about. That Notre Dame game might be one of the better games uh, in this bowl docket. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Brock Purdy is the real deal. I, I believe in his ability to throw the football. And interestingly, like Iowa State's defensive numbers have kind of gotten better towards the tail end of the season as well. And that's kind of where they made their bread and butter last year, too, was with the defense. Brock Purdy was awesome, too. But, like, the defense was kind of the, I would say, the key to them really doing what they did last year. So seeing them improve throughout the year is interesting. Uh, Purdy didn't have, like, a a great year by any means. But I still, like you, believe in the talent there and think that eventually over a larger sample, that's going to win out. So uh, definitely an interesting one there for sure. But let's dive into the Citrus Bowl here, Ed. We got your Michigan against Alabama. And I always like talking to you about Michigan because I love your level of insight into this team. And it's an interesting one here because the narrative around this game is that Alabama may not care all that much because they're finally not in the playoff. They also don't have Tua. You mentioned the cornerback is sitting out. And... So it's hard to quantify, I guess, how yeah. much a team is going to care. Does that impact your willingness to bet this game, given that there are some intangibles that the, the numbers may not be able to capture necessarily? Yeah, I mean, we can kind of we can kind of guess at some of those things, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, my numbers say that Alabama should win by about 12, 11.8 points. Um, I think you need an obvious adjustment since Tua is not going to be playing in this game. You can get a sense for what that adjustment should be from the Auburn game. So my number said that Alabama should win by seven. The closing market was three and a half points. Uh, so to, uh, to Mac Jones is about three and a half points. Seems reasonable to me. Um, 
But, you know, this market, this market value is at seven. So that's another one and a half points. And, you know, you can probably talk yourself into that because of the absences. Um, T- Trayvon Diggs is the cornerback that I mentioned earlier. Uh, he's going to be out. Terrell Lewis is a, is a pass rusher that's had six sacks, 11 and a half tackles for loss. And also remember, Alabama lost three of their starters on the front in the front seven uh, earlier this year as well. It hasn't been the same defense. Um, I I. I don't want to bet this game. I, yeah. I think the markets are going to be able to do a better job with these injury assessments than I am. I think Alabama by seven is fair. Uh, might lean towards Michigan just because I feel like they're not missing anybody. And, uh, and you know, they have a lot to prove after after kind of a disappointing game against Ohio State, disappointing beginning of the season. Um, so, yeah, I mean, lots to consider in this game, and, and it should be a good one on New Year's Day. And that was interesting, too, because Michigan, I think, came out together and said that they were on the same page as it pertained to whether or not they'd be sitting out this game. And it seems like everyone is on board. They're going to be playing this game. And I think that that would give me more faith in backing them. I agree with you where I don't want to I don't actually want to bet this game because I think that the line is pretty efficient. They're accounting for those, those factors really well. But it seems like Michigan is taking this game pretty seriously right now, at least based on reading the tea leaves and the way that they've been talking about this game. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I mean, they, they you know, they they kind of came out pretty flat last year against Florida, so it's not out of the question that they would do that. Um, a couple other things to think about uh, on, from the Alabama perspective. I mean, they have definitely had some poor bowl showings when they weren't in the championship game. Uh, there was a game against Utah, and there was also a game where they lost to Oklahoma in the Sugar Bowl as well. I mean, it's, you know, I think you can count on one hand uh, the number of years in the last decade that Alabama hasn't been playing in the title game. So, um also, I don't think we're done with Bama players not playing in this game. Okay. Uh, I mean, I actually made a list of projected first and second round players for Alabama. Um, I only looked at one mock draft, but, did, you know, I mean, it was it was a list of eight guys. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of them was Jerry Judy. He said he's definitely playing. So, you know, props to him for doing that. But I, I don't know if we've seen the last of Alabama players sitting out this game. And I think that that's important, too, because when you look at Mac Jones, one of the reasons why you can still project him to be decently efficient is because of the people around him. So if you lose right. one of those three disgusting wide receivers, that's pretty impactful. If you lose uh, their tackle, who is projected to be a first-round pick, too, that's pretty impactful. And there's a lot of fragility there when it comes to Michigan's or to Alabama's side. So if you feel a bit better about the Michigan side than we do, you would be wise to bet it now before that news sure. comes out. Again, we think this is a pretty efficient line at, at uh, Alabama minus seven, total is 59. We think that's pretty efficient, but if you have a, a further inclination towards Michigan, maybe you like what the offense did in the second half of the year and you want to buy into that, it'd probably be wise to do so before we get further announcements about Alabama, which is something that we could still see. Anything else do you have on this Ed game, or on this game, Ed? Um, no, I mean, I think we covered, covered most of it. Um, I think, you know, kind of from the fan perspective, uh, you know, this is, a, this is an opportunity for Michigan. Yeah. Uh, when they first announced the bowl game, I was kind of like, Oh, that kind of, that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> but given the circumstances, given that Alabama doesn't have their starting quarterback and five stars on defense, um, this is a real opportunity for Michigan. So yeah. they, you know, they may, may take advantage of it. And you kind of don't want to go into the offseason with a really bad taste in your mouth. So a lot of motivation there for Michigan. I think that's at least impactful, uh, but an efficient line overall. Let's move now to the Rose Bowl. We got Oregon versus Wisconsin here. Wisconsin, two and a half point favorite. The total is 51 points. And Oregon coming off a huge win against a very good Utah team. But We've been pretty into Wisconsin uh, relative to markets. Ed, you had them uh, in the Big Ten championship game or your numbers like them. How do you see this game playing out with two teams that I think are have been interesting from a betting perspective pretty much the entire year long? Yeah, I mean, my numbers really think that Wisconsin is better on both sides of the ball. Uh, when I look at adjusted success rate, they're sixth on offense, second on defense. And that's what really propelled me to like them uh, against Minnesota uh, late in the season, that and the fact that I don't, I thought the markets in Minnesota a little bit overrated. Yeah. Um, when you look at when you look at Oregon, they're 23rd on offense and 14th on defense. Uh, the defense got off to a torrid start. Uh, was pretty much uh, was was really good for a while, then struggled uh, a little bit later in the season. And um, the offense is is pretty good with Justin Herbert. So 
Uh, my number's like Oregon, uh, sorry, Wisconsin by three points in this game. So that suggests two and a half is, is pretty efficient. Um, so, you know, no opinion on the side there. And um, I haven't thought much about the total, but my number is actually at 57, which is yeah. quite a bit larger than uh, than than what the market is. Um, so it might be a thing where it should be a little bit lower, just probably because Wisconsin's defense looked worse by yards per play, which is actually what goes into my totals model right now and right. not success rate. So uh, a little bit of caution there. But um, but yeah, it should it should be a good game. Um, this is a Rose Bowl game, and people players don't sit out the Rose Bowl they, for whatever reason. Uh, good marketing over a hundred years <laughs> of of uh, calling it the granddaddy of them all. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have that to think about. I think both these teams will be pretty pumped to be there, uh, which will not be the case in the Sugar Bowl, which we'll which yeah. we'll talk about next. Um, so yeah, I mean the Rose Bowl definitely has some mystique, and for good reason. Uh, right. If you've never been there. It's on New Year's Day in Pasadena. It's that 3.30, uh, I guess, uh, at whatever the time slot is. 5.30 Eastern, I think. Yeah, 5.30 Eastern, and the sun yeah. sets over the Rose Bowl uh, during the second half of the game. It's a, it's a pretty perfect environment, great environment for football. Uh, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to go three times. Oh, okay. I was going to ask who you'd been. Okay. Yeah. So I saw Stanford get beat by Wisconsin in the Ron Dane year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then saw Stanford beat Wisconsin one year and then uh, get get upset by Michigan State uh, a couple years after that. Yeah, I would love to go to that game, mostly because I have always lived in very cold weather parts of the country. And the thought of going to uh, right. California in January sounds pretty sweet to me. Uh, but I think that this game is also interesting from like a an evaluation perspective because – Justin Herbert is going to be draft eligible. He is draft eligible. He will be in the draft this year. And right. a, a lot of my work over at Number Fire revolves around evaluating quarterback prospects. And I still have sure. no idea what to think of Justin Herbert because we've got <laughs> this very large sample on this guy. You know, NFL yeah. scouts seem to love him, but the numbers are, I don't want to say, I, I feel like mediocre is, is kind of like a, a negative word, but I feel like they're aggressively right. mediocre. Like, they're aggressively good. They're not great. They're aggressively good is the way that I would deem them. His adjusted yards per attempt, 9.2. That's not bad. Uh, But his yards per attempt, 8.2. That's not huge. Uh, Yeah. And those numbers do matter when evaluating quarterbacks. Experience matters a lot. Age matters a lot, too. So it's not the only factor. But, like, I still don't know what to think about this guy. And seeing him against a really good defense, again, because Utah, very good, too. So seeing another sample but, of him against a good defense is impactful. Yeah, but let's talk about that Utah game. He, I mean, he I, was not the reason they won. You're right. Yes. No, but I but I felt like Utah had their bad game on defense. Right? They yeah. got gashed by a lot of big plays. I mean, it's something that hadn't happened. Uh, we know there's kind of a lot of randomness in 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 big plays from from the research that Bill Connolly has done. A couple of like pretty nasty break, uh, just uh, busted coverages in the secondary. Yeah. So you know, there's a couple. You know, this and this is why PFF is good because they'll grade like they. You know, he had a touchdown throw, which was not the hardest throw, but the guy was wide open and just you know, you know, went 30 yards for a touchdown. Right. So, um, you know, they they clearly had a good performance against Utah in that game. I don't think that necessarily makes me believe that Justin Herbert should be a top pick, even though he he might be. Um, a lot of the numbers are, yeah, aggressively average. I think that's a good way of putting it. And you always, I, I mean, I'm always a little, he's had a pretty good year. He's exceeded my expectations this year. But I think yeah. you always get a little nervous with a quarterback prospect when the first thing out of a scout's mouth is, Arm. he's six Size, six and a great yeah. athlete. It's like, yeah, but what about his, you know, what about his accuracy? Yeah. Tell me about his accuracy, because that's the first thing. And then, you know, if he's got a cannon for an arm and he's six six and a good athlete, that's obviously important in the modern NFL as well. Right. And a good arm is good, but if that good arm doesn't translate to good production, then what's the point? Uh, I guess it's always been kind of my perspective on it. I know that, like, we've seen Josh Allen, you know, improve a lot this year, but he's right. still not good. And, like, I feel still like that's kind, of, that's kind of the mistake that uh, Candy made. So, in the, the – I always like. I always think there's value in watching players. I'm very much a data yeah. guy first and foremost, but I think there's value in watching players. I am more desperate to watch players where I deviate from consensus, and I think I deviate a bit from consensus on Justin Herbert. So I think I really want to watch this game, see how he does against another good defense, because 
I still don't have a firm grasp on what to think about this guy. But the line's here, pretty efficient uh, with Wisconsin at two and a half point favor. Let's move now to that Sugar Bowl. After uh, the announcements this week with Georgia, they are now a six and a half point favorite over Baylor. The total is down to 41. It was 41 and a half prior to that. And we also still don't really know about Charlie Brewer's availability going into this game. They actually played pretty well without him in the Big 12 <laughs> Championship. So how are you viewing this game, Ed? Because there's a lot of moving pieces here between the Baylor quarterback situation, all the Georgia guys potentially sitting. There's a lot to juggle here. Yeah, I'm still angry at the the Baylor third string quarterback for busting those two big plays and yep. and not letting <laughs> Oklahoma cover the nine yep. or whatever points that I that I need in that game. I I'm personally not going to make too much of those two big plays. Um, I think the backup was not very good, if I remember right. Um, well, he got like effectively benched, right? And then they moved to the yeah. third stringer. Yeah. Yeah, so, and the third stringer was a true freshman or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I think it's one of these things, like a program like Baylor, like, and and they're, you know, I think they should be pretty excited to be in a New Year's Six Bowl. I think they'll they'll get, I think Brewer is probably going to play unless there's something really wrong with him. Um, But this is the Sugar Bowl. Uh, Two of Georgia's best defensive players decided not to play last year. They lost by 14 points, which you know, wasn't just the defense's fault. Like the offense didn't show up for pretty much the first time. One of the first times last season. Uh, remember that was a pretty potent offense by Jake Fromm last year. That has not really been the case this year. Uh, and it's just interesting. You know, you, when you come into the season and you say, Hey, quarterback's back. Sure. They lost their top three receivers, but it's Georgia. They recruit. Well, um, you know, you just reload and you go. Yeah. That didn't really happen this year. Um, they, they weren't, they weren't explosive at all. Um, even though they were pretty good, 13th in, in my adjusted success rate on offense. Um, so, oh, <laughs> can I read my favorite part of the report? Yeah. Um, and this is before the news today. Uh, Georgia had two players skip a New Year's Six bowl game last season. And I wonder if top prospects like offensive tackle Andrew Thomas and, and running back DeAndre Swift might do the same. So Thomas has already announced. Nailed it. Um, so, um, and, and I just, I don't know. Swift had two carries in the SEC title game. Like what, I mean... I mean, I guess he's had a month to heal the shoulder, get ready. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, th- I think obviously like these absences, you know, are there more absences from Georgia that, that could potentially, uh, you know, hurt them even more? Uh, we shall see. Um, so, and, and you got you to gotta remember, like, I think Georgia came into this year thinking they were a playoff team. I think they thought they were a playoff team, in, you know, until the SEC title game where, where they obviously were not as good as LSU in that game. Uh, a little bit of disappointment in that performance. Baylor is going to be is going to be pretty pumped to be in this yeah. game. I think that the, the thing that's more confusing about Georgia's offense not being all that impressive this year is that they did lose NFL talent, and that always matters. Like if you are undrafted and and you go away, that matters. But it's not like they had like first round picks who who left as their wide receiver. Miko Hardman uh, left, obviously a major speed component there, but. He was not right. a focal point in their offense by any means, uh, from a you know like a market share perspective. Riley Ridley, I believe, went undrafted. He's actually gotten some run with the, with the Bears recently, uh, but like he was not right. a high end prospect. Terry Godwin, another guy who's in the NFL, but like kind of like a practice squad type dude. Isaac Nada, uh, their tight end. I think he's with the Lions still. I believe he played a couple snaps uh, like last week. So like they're four guys who are currently at least tangentially on NFL rosters right now. And that matters. But I think that I was with you where I was willing to discount it quite a bit because it's not like these guys were first round picks. Now, Harden went in the second round. That was weird uh, because he wasn't projected anywhere near there. It was the Tyree kill situation going on, but I was willing to discount it too. And I think that it's been hard for me to like abandon my prior on Jake Fromm because I went into this year thinking pretty highly of him. His yards per attempt right. as a true freshman was 9.0. It was 9.0 last year, too. He was not this dink and dunk conservative type quarterback. There were tendencies right. in there that, you sure. know, we've seen kind of fleshed out this year. But my prior on Jake Fromm is that he's pretty freaking good, and it's yeah. been really hard for me to, to divorce myself from that take. Yeah, and you and you saw them come out against LSU and, and throw right. the ball down the field, and the receivers Can't dropped a couple it. passes. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm with you on Fromm. I think he's good. I mean, I think he you know, evolved very quick as a freshman from dink and dunk to someone that was, you know, throwing some pretty long passes against Alabama in the title game. And, uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, it, 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 
you know, I mean, it, again, like my numbers have liked the over on this Georgia team for for a long for for a long part of the year because yeah. they kind of expect um, Georgia to be what we expected them on offense. It hasn't happened. I thought it might happen against LSU. Uh, it didn't. Maybe it'll happen against Baylor. Although yeah, I think Baylor's know. defense is very good and very physical. Do you have a feeling on the spread here at six and a half points? Um, I mean, my number says Georgia by eight. I'm. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right way yeah. to lead. Uh, and given... that's before all the the guys sitting out is factored in too. So probably pretty efficient, right? Six and a half. Probably. Okay, let's move on to a couple other bowls here because. Well, well go ahead. Oh, I was going to say we'll get to a we'll get to a game in which I think the line is vastly non efficient uh, in covering the future. So okay, we're we're going to talk about that one later. Uh, any other bowls you'd like to highlight where your number shows some value for uh, this season? Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about USC versus Iowa, and I want to talk about it in terms of your bowl pool and, and yeah. thinking contrarian uh, because seventy three percent of brackets have picked Iowa over USC. And just kind of zoom back and just think about Iowa, USC, and then think about 73% of people picking Iowa. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really make sense to me. And it, it kind of goes to show you, you know, it, it, it gets pretty bad when the public's trying to pick bowl games, especially some of these. I mean, these, these are two power five teams that people know a lot about. Um, usually when you have this type of like, you know, kind of inefficiency in what people are picking, it's because of record, but... They kind of had similar records this year. I think Iowa was nine and three, and USC was eight and four, or something like that. So, anyways, this is this is an opportunity for you to get ahead in your bowl pool. So, um, my numbers say that Iowa has a fifty-two percent chance to win. So, the idea with contrarian strategies, if you're in a pool with more than thirty people, you would say, "All right, I'm going to pick USC, and I'm going to lower the expected number of points that I'm going to get in this pool." But I'll take it because I'm going to give this game a lot of confidence points, and I'm essentially going to increase the variance of my results. So if USC wins, they cash in on the 48% win probability, I'm going to get a ton of points that not a lot of other people in my pool are going to get. And I think there's really good reason to think um, that USC can win this game, not not just because of the numbers. Like Their offense has been really good. They were eighth in my adjusted success rate, and that is with uh, not with the starter, JT Daniels, who got hurt. Um, in the first game of the year, USC's defense has been terrible. Uh, they're 79th in my adjusted success rate, but you know, good enough to save Clay Helton's job. So, um, and you know, Iowa just not particularly exciting on either side of the ball. Uh, by my adjusted success rate, they're 40th on offense, 29th on defense. I, I mean, I could very well see USC winning this game. It's in San Diego, a little bit closer to home. So uh, that that's an interesting game for me. Yeah, and I think that for me, I'm guessing is it is the negative sentiment around USC due to the Clay, Hel- Clay Helton stuff because there was I think it was I don't want to say there was a, a, a an outlet a major outlet that reported that he was fired at one point and then obviously came back you know he was never fired there was just an erroneous report is that stink around them is that what causing the public to gravitate so oh, heavily no. towards Iowa? I don't know. I mean, what what is so exciting about this Iowa team? Uh, you know, like, I mean, what gets you fired up about Iowa? I mean, Nate Stanley's an okay quarterback. Um, I I don't know. Like AJ Epinesa is good. Yeah, um, he's, he's good. He's I'm excited play. about watching play. Tristan Wurst is going to play. Uh, they've both committed to that. But Michael Pittman's going to play for USC too. So this is a pretty like this is a pretty you know locked or loaded game. And it seems like yeah. most of the big guys are going to be playing. It's just hard for me to figure out why. I guess there's been some stink around USC for a while now. So maybe like they become like the anti-public team, uh, like the the non-Dallas Cowboys for some reason. But I don't know. It's yeah. interesting. I don't really, I don't really get it. What if you're in a small pool, Ed? Uh, let's say you're in a small pool, just your family. You know, you got five to ten people. Would you still be inclined to try to increase the variance there, or are you just going straight up in a, in a pool of that size? No, I would I would just go straight up, uh, use my numbers. A uh, couple options there. Uh, you can get uh, my points based numbers uh, if you sign up for my email newsletter. So that's an easy way to fill out your confidence points there. Uh, or you can get my member numbers if if uh, you buy the the bowl report, or become a member of my site. So that'll help you out there. Yeah. So 
keep in keep in mind uh, the size of the pool. That's something Ed wrote about in his book, uh, How to Win Your March Madness Bracket, which I still have in my desk over here somewhere. Um, I'll have to find awesome. out before March. Uh, but he wrote about it in his book. It's a great strategy both for that and for this. So kind of like we said, a good warm-up for March. We're going to dive into another game here in just one second. But first, Ed and I always preach searching for the best value when betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is a premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Never settle, always get the best odds. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Check out the experience for free now on numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Covering the future. All right, let's close out the bold discussion here with covering the future. And Ed, last year, like I said, the Cheez It Bowl was one for the ages. I remember they had a graphic up during the game where they had changed it to Cheese INT Bowl because I think that there were more interceptions than there were completions, I, I believe. I'm trying to remember the specifics of it because this is a glorious game that deserves to be memorialized. Statues should be made about the Cheez It Bowl. And this year, we get a pretty interesting matchup between Washington State and Air Force. What do your numbers say about this game? Yeah, I find this game super interesting. I mean, Washington State came into the season with, uh, you know, like, like preseason top 25 hype. You can understand it. They had a tremendous year in 2018. Uh, they were 11-2. and two. Maybe a little bit inflated record because they were 4-1 and one in one-score games, uh, which is something that I look for. But you could have definitely talked yourself into the sense that Mike Leach had figured it out at Washington State. He had averaged four wins in his first three years there, and then he had averaged over nine wins in the last four years uh, at Washington State. So you could think that they were consistently going to win eight to nine games, be a top 25-ish team every year, and that's basically what Mike Leach did at Texas Tech. Well, then this season happened, and uh, they didn't do so well. They went six and six, so they barely made the bowl game here. The offense was brilliant. Uh, My adjusted success rate, they were fourth in the nation, Not shocking, given what Mike Leach uh, normally does. But the defense completely cratered. They were terrible. And I think they moved up to to get to 89th in my adjusted success rate for the season. So now they're playing Air Force. And this is a team that got no votes in the preseason AP poll. Um, And when I did my numbers, they were 70th. But they've had a tremendous season. They've been 10-2. and And when I look at numbers from this season, so I look at points success rate, yards per play, put them together according to weights that I think are most predictive. Air Force is 29th in the nation. So that's pretty good. However, that's actually still one spot behind Washington State. So Washington State is still the better team, even if you just take the data from this season. Uh, A lot of that's obviously propelled by the offense. A lot of that is strength of schedule adjustments, uh, Pac-12 versus Mountain West. Um, So if you made, you know, if they would have played in the first game of the year on a neutral site, you know, Washington State would have been a big favorite. But even after all the data from the current season, the numbers still like Washington State. Um, also, I mentioned those preseason polls because that's still a powerful predictor at, at this point in the year. Uh, a higher ranked team in the preseason poll has won over 58 percent of bowl games, which is pretty remarkable given the fact that they have no data from the current season. So. Uh, last I checked, Air Force was a three-point favorite. I think that's kind of insane. Uh, I'll take Washington State plus three. And that is still the number at FanDuel Sportsbook right now, uh, Washington State plus three. And I think part of the reason why, you know, you could – I think that the rebuttal to Washington State and maybe ignoring their preseason things is saying, well, Gardner Minshew's better than we thought – I don't know if that's necessarily true. Uh, If you look at Gardner Minshew's efficiency numbers in the NFL this year, he's right above Mitchell Trubisky. And we don't talk about Gardner Minshew the same way we talk about Mitchell Trubisky, partly because of expect. I mean, almost entirely because of expectations. Trubisky is the second overall pick. Uh, Minshew is a mid-round guy. But at the end of the day, it's not as if he is some elite NFL star in the making. He's he's fine. You know, he's 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 an okay quarterback who can pass as a starter when he needs to. But when you look at your your numbers and see how good the offense was, I think that's a pretty resounding rebuttal to the thought that we should toss out all preseason data on Washington State because Gardner Minshew was a bigger factor than expected. Those numbers right. seem to prove that these numbers are are legitimate. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think they're, you know, I mean, you can kind of always trust Washington State on offense. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's a year that you, you, you couldn't. Now, yeah. if you take Washington State plus three and Air Force gets up a couple touchdowns, which could be possible given how bad their defense is, uh, you know, you might hate me for a while. But <laughs> I think the offense, I mean, I think by, you know, by the time you, you end up playing the full game, Washington State is going to be there. And I think, I mean, I think they can win this game outright. And there are a lot of teams that cannot make up a deficit. Washington State is one that definitely can. So I think that's uh, reassuring if they do happen to fall behind. For my cover in the future, I want to talk about a non-college football thing because FanDuel Sportsbook just released the odds for the 2020 NASCAR Cup Series Championship and for the Daytona 500. And I have a lot of very personal takes on these, which you can ask me about if you like NASCAR. Uh, (laughs) But... I'm going to limit it to just one here, limit my enthusiasm, and it's a number that stood out to me as being kind of jarring, uh, but that's Chris Buescher at 75-1 to to win the Daytona 500. And one of the key things with NASCAR as you move to a new season is you have to account for drivers moving into new equipment because Buescher... He's one of the guys with the new ride for 2020. He is going back to Roush Fenway Racing. He was a development guy there back in the day. Now going to be a full-time driver there in the Cup Series. And that puts him back into Ford. And Fords have been pretty dominant at pack racing tracks recently, whereas Bush has been in a Chevy in much worse equipment. But this is a car specifically that has done well at this track type. It used to be Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s ride. Stenhouse Jr., is 20 to 1 because he's been good on pack racing tracks. He won the Daytona or he won the July Daytona race back in 2017. He's led a bunch of laps on this track type, and that's largely because Stenhouse is good on this track type. But it also means that his equipment can play here, and Busher, also a pretty good driver at Daytona. He was fifth at Daytona in both of the 2018 races. He was 10th in 2017 as well. So we have a driver who was good on this track type. When he was in really bad equipment, he is now in much better equipment, and he's 75-1 to to win the Daytona 500. He has longer odds than a dude who does not currently have a ride for 2020 in Daniel Hemrick. So I want to take advantage of guys who are moving into better equipment as the season changes. Uh, You know, other big benefactors of equipment changes are Matt DiBenedetto, you got Cole Custer, uh, Tyler Reddick. But all three of those guys are 50 to 1 or shorter, and DiBenedetto is 32 to 1. I don't think that's a terrible number, honestly. But Busher is 75 to 1. He allows you to take advantage of the changes in equipment and get some pretty long odds to boot. I think that if I were personally making a number for Busher, I have not done on my model yet because there's still some, you know, guys like Daniel Suarez who are potentially in flux for this year. I would think he should be closer to like 40 or so if you put DiBenedetto at 32. I think that putting Busher at 40 ish should probably be better uh so when the gap is that large between about 40 to 1 and 75 to 1 i'm okay with locking up my bankroll uh for a couple of months it's in in mid-february so two months uh and plunging in on busher at 75 to 1 i would not expect him to close at 75 to 1 i think around 40 is more realistic there uh but i think it's just it's important to know that there are certain drivers changing equipment for 2020 in NASCAR, and that's a major factor. Chris Busch is one of the better factors, and that is not being baked into his number. And, and I think that this is one of the more interesting things with NASCAR is like, you know, for college football, Dabo Sweeney is still going to be there. Uh, you know, we can change out all the, the stuff. But like with NASCAR, a driver is not the same driver if he's in different equipment. And of like, course, yep. it's really interesting to me. That, I think that's one of the parts I find fascinating about NASCAR is like, you're literally a different driver if you're a different car, which is, it's just wild. Right. I mean, I love it. I love this time of year. I mean, what's the variance in car? Big. Abilities. Big. Big? <laughs> so let me think of, a, of an example here. Uh, okay. So Matt Benedetto, let me pull up his numbers here, in 2018 was with Go Fast Racing. And it wasn't the best equipment. Uh, he went to Levine Family Racing last year. And the start of the year wasn't good. But he eventually picked things up, um, and he got going on tracks that were less equipment-focused, but uh, it was really dramatic. So in 2018, with Go Fast Racing, Matt Benedetto, his average finish was 27th out of 40 cars. This year, his average finish was 18.3, and Mm. he's not in his peak. Uh, He went from his age 26 to his age 27 season. The peak for NASCAR is your age 39 season, for some reason. Mm. It's just what it is. Uh, Mm. But, like... The only change for him was his equipment, and he improved nine spots in the running order. 
Right. And I find all that very fascinating. I think that that's kind of like a, it's an inefficiency that people know about but don't account enough for. Like we talk about inefficiencies of the bowl games, like guys sitting out. People right. account for it, but I think with NASCAR, they don't account for it enough when their equipment changes. Interesting. I mean, can't you just quantify how much better equipment A is than equipment B? Yeah, that's that's something I try to do. Um, I do a primer at the end of the or at the right before the regular season starts for number fire, where I look at the average driver ratings for each driver within a team and try to uh, bake up what that equipment is worth. And uh, oh man, hmm. uh, I forgot his name here. Uh, David Smith of the Athletic does a great job of accounting for equipment. He has its peer production and equi- equal equipment. Rating. We'll try to get David Smith on at some point before uh, the 2020 season starts, but he quantifies equipment that way. And it tries to take out the equipment, look at just the driver and sure. it's really interesting data. So it's uh, you can quantify it, but I don't think sports books care enough about NASCAR to do so, which is fine. <laughs> okay with that. <laughs> yeah, you should be okay with that. Yeah, so we'll see how this goes, uh, but I do think that uh, Chris Bush is interesting. You can find those numbers for the 2020 championship and for the Daytona 500 now over at uh, sportsbook.fanduel.com. Ed, we're about to bust into bowl season. Should be a whole lot of fun. Absolutely. Uh, do you get time? I know it's a busy time of year. Do you get time to actually like sit down and watch these games, or, or is life a bit too hectic for you eventually. this time of year? I mean, eventually. You know, I mean, things are busy up until when the bowls start. Yeah. And then there's, you know, there's kind of, I mean, still people like, like my stuff because, you know, they're betting on games and stuff. Right. But, you know, there's a big push until the Bulls start 2 p.m. on Friday, which is, geez, only two days away from now. Um, and then after that, try to recover a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll definitely be watching some some football on Saturday. Plus, you got love... all the NFL games on Saturday, too. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I just <laughs> love the, the feeling of like, wrapping presents like you know like hanging out uh and having a bowl game on in like the background so like i may not be playing like paying like intent attention to all these there are some where i definitely want to for like nfl evaluation purposes but like i just love being able to have it on the background uh having some football on all the time it's it's really joyous so we're about to get that cranky Ed, I want to thank you for uh, spreading all of your info for today where can people find your stuff and get that bowl report one more time yeah, if you're interested in the bowl report, uh, these are my member numbers. Only time of year you can get my best college football numbers without becoming a member of the site. You can go to thepowerrank.net. That's a URL that will take you to a page on my site where you can learn more. Uh, also, the option of becoming a member. Uh, if you do become a member before Friday at 2 p.m., I'm actually having a drawing for five copies of The Logic of Betting. Uh, it's a book by Ed Miller and, and Matthew Davidow. Really good book with a lot of insights in there. Um, so going to have a drawing, going to send out books before, uh, before the new year for sure. Uh, probably next week. Um, so just an extra bonus. If you do, uh, decide you want to become a member of the power rank before Friday at 2 PM and a potential Christmas present for yourself as well. Make sure you check out Ed's podcast too about the bowl season uh, by searching for the Football Analytics Show as well. Find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank and all his work over at thepowerrank.com. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Swinging back in tomorrow with a Week 17, or Week 16, I keep saying Week 17, Week 16 NFL preview with Edward E. Gross breaking down where he sees some value on that slate. Big Thank you to Calvin Theobald for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always, for doing that. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. We'll talk to you again tomorrow to break down some NFL bets for this weekend. But until then, good luck with your bets. We'll talk to you again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 